Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, where today we will be talking about the squats. Dun dun dun. Now, before we begin, it is important that all of you realize that if any of you normal people talk about the squats, Games Workshop will have you killed. That's just how that goes. But I can talk about it because I'm an Inquisitor, and I have judged that the 50 50 chance of you being killed by Games Workshop just from learning about the squats is well within acceptable parameters. Now, before we get into the lore itself, let me just briefly explain what the squats are and, well, why they are no more. You see, way back in the mists of time, when Rogue Trader was a thing, which I still maintain is practically a separate universe to 40k, there was a race known as the squats, which were, well, space dwarves. Literally, space dwarves. And the reason for this is that back then, Rogue Trader was very, very literally only supposed to be a sci-fi version of Warhammer. There were no plans as of yet to build it into its own separate universe, or really to build any universe at all. Back then, the entire idea was that these would be colourful plastic toys with a rule set around them. There was as of yet no real clear inkling or idea of what the setting would eventually become. The two settings were in fact so intertwined that they actually shared a few models and storylines. For example, some of the very early Tyranids were first playable in Warhammer, and there were also whispered rumours that we would be getting Space Lizardmen, since of course both universes share the myth of the Old Ones. In Rogue Trader lore, the Squats were a part of the Imperium, or, well, not really actually. They were a part of the Imperium in the same way that the Mechanicus was, as in they were a separate entity within the umbrella of the Imperium. They were, for all intents and purposes, a sovereign nation that existed inside of the Imperium and worshipped the Emperor. As far as their tabletop flavour went, they were essentially a... Well, a, a dwarf army. They had a lot of shooting, a lot of ridiculous over-engineered units, and they even had a robots with AI. This was, of course, before it became established in canon that AI would always try to wipe out everything that lived in the galaxy. They also had access to tons and tons and tons of bikes. The dwarves were apparently very, 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 very fond of bikes, leading to the meme of space bikers rather than space dwarves. They also had access to war trains, massive choo-choo land trains with guns and guns and guns and more guns and a couple more guns. Hell, it would hardly be an exaggeration to say that their guns had guns on them. They also had miniature walking dreadnoughts, essentially. Dwarves in Terminator-esque armor that were practically invulnerable. They even had actual dwarf dreadnoughts with ancient venerable dwarfies inside of them, etc, etc. To put it mildly, the Squats were all seven flavours of batshit insanity. They were so far over the top that even the Orcs would look up at them, no pun intended, whilst green with envy. And back in those days, they weren't just fluff either. They did have an army list of sorts for 40k. They had an unofficial one released in a White Dwarf magazine, or in fact several, I do think, that you could essentially gathered together in a form of compendium which would function as a de facto army book. There were also quite a lot of rumblings during 2nd edition that they would essentially receive a full-on codex at some undisclosed point in the nebulous future. This, of course, never happened. There was, however, a full-on set of rules available for them in Epic, which was a specialised game, which is essentially a spin-off of 40k. In this case, Epic was there to simulate large-scale battles using smaller models. So you would, for example, have one base of infantry, which would essentially then be one squad. And you would have way, way bigger units. You would be able to field Titans, the war trains of the squats, the hellbores, all manners of insanity. You would have entire units, basically, of tanks and land raiders and bane blades, etc., and all of this long before the days of the Apocalypse rule set. Everything looked to be going just fine for the poor little squatties. They had their own units, their own rules, and a presence in both 40k and the specialist games range. Hell, there were even chaos squats 
yes, really, they were Chaos Dwarves in 40k at one point. They even had their own models. Granted, they were the kind of models you'd have to order off the back of a catalogue, but they did exist. The future looked rosy indeed for our little space dwarves, and then they got eaten by Tyranids. And yes, that is... that really is about it. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. They got written out of the lore in like one line of text. We don't even know for sure which Tyranids ate them. Hell, they were located near the galactic core on worlds that were described as being virtually barren of life, highly technological society that essentially survived off food shipments from the wider Imperium and a few hydroponic establishments. Not exactly the kind of targets the Tyranids would usually be heading towards. We can speculate that it was probably a splinter fleet from High Fleet Behemoth, but we don't actually know. All we know is that the squats pretty much all got eaten, and what remained of the squats got integrated into the wider Imperium. Now, do bear in mind, there are still squats in the Imperium. In fact, we even have hints that they still are serving within the Imperial Guard in their own abhuman regiments, but they are no longer a sovereign nation within the Imperium. They are now proper law-abiding Imperial citizens. And we're probably never going to see much from them ever again. Now, to be fair, we did recently receive news of one model for Necromunda, but I, I gotta crush a lot of hopes here. I do not think this signals a return of the squats to 40k. I would be very surprised, although a little delighted, if we ever saw the Space Dwarves in 40k again. Now, with the backstory out of the way, let's actually talk some lore, shall we? The Space Dwarves, also commonly referred to as the Squats or Homo Sapiens Rotundus. Yes, seriously. <laughs> I, I kind of understand why Games Workshop decided they would be eaten by the Tyranids. Anywho, the Space Dwarves, soon to be Tyranid snacks, were short, muscular, and quite fat little creatures. They were also very, very, very tough. Apparently, they had all of their settlements near the core of the Milky Way galaxy, and like other abhumans, they were originally humans that had colonized these worlds during the Great Golden Age of Technology. They are now classified as abhumans, which means that the Imperium has recognized that they have mutated, yes, but they have mutated well within the requirements to still be recognized as humans. Now, of course, even within abhumans, there are many, 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 many different variations. Some are um, afforded considerably more privileges than others. Some are even considered to essentially be full citizens of the Imperium, while others are primarily used as... Well, kind of a slave race, really. The Ogrins is a good example of this, although, to be fair, the Ogrins don't really have enough intelligence to the point where they could actually understand what citizenship even meant, so... I mean, can you actually call it slavery if they're too stupid to understand what slavery is? In before somebody cuts that out of context and claims it's my stance on black people. <sighs> Anyways, the Dwarves, however, or the Squats, sorry, were definitely amongst the higher ends of the privileged spectrum, since they were given de facto independence beneath the umbrella of the Imperium. They are essentially in the exact same position as the Adeptus Mechanicus in that they are technically allied to the Imperium, but for all intents and purposes they function within the Imperium system of government. But it was not always so. The history of the Squats stretched back all the way, as I mentioned, to the Golden Age of Technology, where humankind first put their grubby little mittens on the stars and claimed considerable portions of the galaxy for their very own. The Squats picked their homeworlds near the galactic core on several very mineral-rich worlds that were, however, rather desolate of life. And since even future space dwarves do need to eat, they sustain themselves through huge underground hydroponic farms and by extensive trade with the then Human Federation of Planets. The Squats would provide the Federation with raw resources and also technical and engineering expertise in return for vast quantities of food and, presumably, mead. <laughs> 
This highly profitable and mutually beneficial cooperation between the Squats and the Federation of Planets continued for about 5,000 years, until the Age of Strife and the massive warp storms that engulfed the entire galaxy. Being near the galactic core, the dwarves were, uh, rather problematically positioned, to put it rather mildly. Their planets were engulfed by massive warp storms, and they could only really communicate within their own little mini-empire. And since they were now cut off from the rest of what was once the Federation of Planets, their trade in food stock plummeted rather rapidly. This led to a period of considerable complications for the poor little space dwarves. Widespread famine, hunger, infighting, raiding, and piratical conflicts began to spread throughout the Squat strongholds. Additionally, many, many, many wonderful and not so friendly Xeno species also saw this as their opportunity to pick away at the once so prospered Federation of Planets. They would steal whatever wasn't nailed down, burn whatever was nailed down, and enslave whatever humans unfortunate enough to not have built a massive fuck-off stronghold. In other words, the Age of Strife, or the Age of Isolation as the Squats called it, was a very, very shitty time to be a Squat. And so, as to survive, they underwent radical changes both in their societal structure and in their physiology. It is slightly unclear whether they evolved into their more squat forms, or if they biologically engineered themselves to be this way, but nevertheless, they eventually became known as the current day squats. Much smaller, tougher, and more resilient creatures that didn't require quite so much in the way of food stuff as their larger cousins. They also developed a brand new societal structure, based upon the twin concepts of guilds, and leagues. They developed several guilds that took care of various parts of the running of society. For example, there was the Engineers Guild, the Agricultural Guild, the Trade Guild, so on and so on, who specialized in certain aspects of keeping the squats alive. Creating enough food, for example, organizing caravans to travel between the squat strongholds, keeping alive the secrets of technology, and, interestingly enough, advancing it whilst the Adeptus Mechanicus essentially came to view technology with a certain irreverence and hoard it simply for the sake of hoarding it, and would eventually go so far as to consider innovating or changing it to be heretical, the Squats went the exact opposite direction. They maintained an understanding of the underlying functionality of technology. In other words, they understood that a computer functioned because of the electrical components inside of it, not because it was imbued with some kind of machine spirit. I will sidetrack a short moment here though to point out that in modern 40k it's not quite that cut and dry, because machine spirits are real things. There are examples in the lore of machines functioning despite the fact that they just flat out should not function, but that of course does not mean that technology doesn't still function because it's technology, but of course, way back in the Rogue Trader days, nobody really thought about it quite to that extent. Now, back to the topic at hand. The other major societal foundation was the Leagues. These are essentially the clans. Each League would form its own little mini-society with its own government, its own rulers, etc. They would build massive fortified cities, and eventually, as they grew and grew and grew and came into conflict with their neighbours, many of these Leagues would then form larger Super Leagues. And eventually this would naturally evolve to the point where major leagues were comprised of several different sub-leagues, rather than just individuals and their families, etc. Eventually this would develop into an extremely hierarchical structure, where all of Squat society could be considered to be one league, and within that one league there would be hundreds of sub-leagues, and within each of those leagues would be thousands of sub-sub-leagues, and so on and so on and so on. After the establishment of these leagues and the massive fortress cities that ensued to keep the Squats alive from all of the various uh, guests that came to visit their homeworlds, they had eventually managed to secure most of their homeworlds, as their little mini-empire became known as. Then, during a slight abatement in the warp storms, they ran into other species as well. 
including the craft world Eldar, which were fleeing the catastrophe, and orcs. This is where Rogue Trader Fluff and 40k Fluff comes into some rather severe lore conflicts. The Squats maintained trade relationships with both the Eldar and the Orcs. Now, trade relationships with the Eldar would not be beyond the realms of possibility. They have traded with different civilizations previously, although it would be fairly rare. The Craftwell Eldar are, by their very nature, extraordinarily isolationists, but it could happen, especially if they were desperate, which they very well might have been shortly after the fall. The Orcs, on the other hand, the Orcs are not much of a mercantile class. They will occasionally engage in very, very low-level diplomacy with other factions, usually through the offering of uh, mercenary services, but full-on trade with the Orcs is extraordinarily unlikely, but back in the Rogue Trader days, the Orcs were far more um, civilized, shall we say. Though, of course, I hasten to add that that is civilized with very, very large quotation marks, as the peace only lasted for about 300 years before a huge Orc fleet decided that why trade with the Squats when we could just take all of their shit? Now that is a far more Orcish and practical solution to the problem. It also had the added benefit of informing the Space Dwarves that they shouldn't trust filthy, dirty Xenos racers. I know they're Dwarves, but there is a limit to how dense you can be, after all. The Dwarves were even silly enough to try and ask the Eldar for help. Oh, kind, gentle Space Elves, please help us against the evil green Orkies. And the Eldar responded by telling the Dwarves to get stuffed. <laughs> What you get for trading with Xenos, you dirty little dwarfs. And so began the Age of War, where the Squats were fighting against the Orcs for a very, very long time. Because, you see, when a major Orc warg lands on your planet, getting rid of them is extraordinarily difficult, unless they're kind enough to engage you in large-scale open field battles. The dwarves thought they would be safer within their massive holdfasts, and of course, partially, they were correct. A lot of orcish blood was spilled actually breaking into these massive fortresses. But here's the problem. Once the orcs were inside, they infested every square centimeter of these massive dwarven holds with their spores, and began growing vast quantities of new orcs directly inside the dwarven homelands. And considering the dwarves grew almost all of their food in vast hydroponic farms, well, let's just say that barley and fungus grow equally well in said farms. This led to hundreds, if not thousands, of years of near constant tunnel fighting with the orcs. The dwarven settlements were like icebergs. They had small areas on the surface, mostly made up of defensive fortifications, and then huge subterranean buildings with miles upon miles upon miles upon miles of tunnels just within a single hold, not to mention even further miles upon miles upon miles upon miles of tunnels connecting the various holds. Through these tunnels, then, the dwarves and the greenskins fought each other with good old-fashioned bitterness and hatred. The dwarves, of course, held their ground pretty well because, well, dwarves. They did, however, also lose several of their homeworlds and several of their holds on these planets to the Orcs. Even to this day, mysterious rumors and legends of these holds will be passed down from squat to squat to squat. I, I could have probably worded that better, but hey, details. And many, many expeditions have been mounted to rediscover these lost holds, kind of like the ones they do in Fantasy Warhammer. Unlike in fantasy, however, the dwarves had friends. The Adeptus Mechanicus, after re-establishing contact, would often join the squats in these reclamation efforts, hoping to uncover treasure troves of lost squat technology. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. The war against the orcs would continue for a very, very long time, and it would be fought with all manners of vicious brutality, with both sides employing, well, pretty much whatever they could get their hands on, and the Squats developed quite a militaristic streak during this age of warfare. 
However, eventually they managed to push back and destroy most of the Greenskins, albeit not quite all. Which is why, of course, we again have the Lost Halls and constant incursion into Squat space by Orc tribes. However, having re-established their foothold, at least to a relatively decent degree, they could once again start looking outwards. And since the warp storms were starting to abate, they began expanding their little empire. Usually, they chose to settle on worlds similar to those like their home worlds, harsh, desolate worlds with large mineral resources. However, having learned the lesson of starvation during the beginning of the Age of Strife, they'd realized that they couldn't rely on outside sources for trade, especially considering the fact that both the Orcs and the Eldar had fucked them quite so thoroughly. They, uh, they weren't particularly fond of either species after that, and as such, they wished to become more self-reliant. This, of course, meant developing new and interesting ways of feeding themselves. And whilst, of course, again, the hydroponic farms had proven effective, they had also proven to have a rather unfortunate side effect in the case of massive orc invasions. And as such, simply settling a world where they could actually till the soil and grow stuff without the needs of these hydroponic farms would undoubtedly be rather beneficial. And we all know there's only two things a space dwarf truly fears. One, running out of beer, and two, becoming not fat. But of course, in the noble quest of finding more food to shove into their little mouths, they had to expand their sphere of influence. This eventually brought them into contact with the rapidly expanding Imperium. The Space Dwarves themselves, of course not having the advantage of being led by Big E himself and his cadre of godlike beings, had not expanded anywhere near as quickly as the Empire, and as such they were still a relatively small but also very, very powerful Xeno species, at least upon first glance. However, after being originally discovered by rogue traders, the Imperium eventually popped their head into the scene and demanded to see the Squats' blood work, so that they could determine whether they were pure mensch or if they were untermensch. And luckily for both the Squats and the Imperium, it turned out that they were indeed mensch. Kleiner mensch, but mensch nonetheless. And I say luckily for both parties because on one hand, the Squats probably wouldn't enjoy being exterminatists, and considering just how heavily dug in the dwarves were, there were only really two options for the Imperium. One, make their planets go poof from orbit, or two, make them fight the fucking Death Guard. Personally, if I were the dwarves, I'd choose Exterminatus, cause, well, it'd be a hell of a lot quicker. And lucky for the Imperium, because, well, the dwarves tended to make their homes on extremely mineral-rich planets, Minerals that the Imperium wanted, which immediately made the prospect of simply making their planet go boom considerably less appealing. On the other hand, having to throw the Death Guard and Mortarion at them for 200 fucking years also wasn't really a particularly appealing prospect. Now, I'm sure that old Grimdark himself would eventually have grinded them into a fine dwarfish pulp, but it probably would have taken a while. And fortunately, this was also one of those circumstances in which diplomacy was actually possible. First and foremost, the dwarves were of course humans, ab-humans obviously, but humans nevertheless. Secondly, they had plenty to offer the Empire, both in terms of raw resources, fighting power, and technology. And thirdly, the dwarves had grown to really, really, really dislike other races. The Eldar, of course, had fucked them in paper form by ignoring their treaties, and the Orcs had fucked them in persona by invading their planets. And so, when they met their long-lost cousins in the rest of humanity, who were literally just like, Orcs? Eldar? No, we pretty much just kill those wherever we come across them. The two were instant soulmates. Now, obviously, the Dwarves were a rather independent lot, and they didn't want to give up all of their shit, after all. If they wanted that, they could simply have rolled over and let the orcs fuck them, and they were rather good at diplomacy, partially due to the fact that they were ludicrously goddamn stubborn. And as a result of this, they developed an intricate network of treaties and agreements between themselves and the Imperium. They would document, legislate, organize, and regulate 
every single last little goddamn thing they would have with the Imperium. Their treaty would eventually become so goddamn dense that it would require trained practitioners just to figure out if something was legal or not on either side of the divide. Of course, the Imperium, being the premier military power, did manage to force through some concessions, like favourable trade treaties and making the Squats fight for the Imperium, but the Squats were also able to retain practically all of their sovereign freedoms within their own little mini-empire. And in the name of maintaining my own little mini-empire, here's an ad. Here's an interesting little factoid. The average view time has actually gone up since I added in mid-roll ads. Admit it, you sick disgusting fucks actually enjoy this shit, don't you? Well, I'm not complaining, but that is one hell of a fetish you've all developed there. Returning to the bearded little space dwarves, with their treaties with the Empire secure, they now entered into an age of prosperity. Relatively speaking, anyways. They also eventually were affected, of course, by the Horus Heresy. Quite a few squat strongholds and worlds declared for Horus and began fighting with their fellow squats. And at the end of the Horus Heresy, these Chaos Squats were sent running and screaming off into the Eye of Terror along with their traitor guardsmen allies. There were also tales that some of the dwarf hordes that had been shifted into the warp during the earlier ages of dwarfdom might have turned into full-on chaos hordes within the Eye of Terror itself. Now this sounds like a bit of a long shot since the Eye of Terror before the whole you know, legionnaires running into there to avoid the vengeance of the Imperium thing, was mostly devoid of normal life. There were a few Eldar tomb worlds, essentially still watched over by their Eldar guardians, by the way, but very little in the way of stable life. It is far more likely that after the defeat of Horus, the Chaos Squads, along with their erstwhile allies, fled inside the Eye of Terror and simply rebuilt, partially at least, squat society within the Eye. Chaosified, obviously, but nevertheless. They would certainly be able to build vast structures within the Eye of Terror, indeed, inside the Eye of Terror, where on some planets the laws of physics and gravity etc simply don't goddamn fucking count, they could probably build even bigger dwarf holds. As for their loyalist brethren, they got through the Horus Heresy relatively well, as well as anybody got through the Horus Heresy anyways, and apparently managed to maintain their fairly independent status within the Imperium, which of course, considering the relatively reduced military strength of the Imperium, might not necessarily speak all that much to the state of the Dwarves, but they undoubtedly did take a bit of a battering, but nowhere near enough for them to be integrated into the wider Imperium, which is of course what happened when the Tyranid apparently showed up. Now, Precisely what happened when the Tyranid showed up is unclear. The poor little squats didn't really get any kind of a, uh, shall we say, dignified exit. They were pretty much just written out of the fluff entirely with one or two lines of text pertaining to a race of space dwarves, the squats getting om nom nom by the Tyranids and that was pretty much it. We don't know how long they fought them, we don't know if they were close to beating them, whether it was a complete walkover, whether they were betrayed maybe, or what happened, they just got numbed. And considering this is a race that managed to hold off a large-scale orc wog and survived the Horus Heresy, wow. I mean, the Tyranids are kind of GW's delete button, I mean, they've wiped out God only knows how many Space Marine chapters that Games Workshop no longer felt like supporting, but <laughs> that was, uh... That was rather quick. And this was of course back in the dark old days, when Games Workshop didn't really feel like communicating a whole lot of stuff to its customer base, and so for the longest time we didn't really know what had happened to the squats. It even became a term that the army got squatted, and many alarmists feared that other races would also get squatted out of absolutely goddamn nowhere. We have received a couple of 
shall we say, insight into why the decision was made to squish the poor little squats, but mm, a lot of them have been somewhat, shall we say, questionable. One of the slightly more believable reasons we have received was that the team who were responsible for the squats just didn't like their creation. Apparently they felt that they'd perpetrated too many stereotypes, that they had just created space dwarves and that they were too laughable, as if they'd made kind of a parody of what they'd actually wanted to create, and so they'd simply just decided to quietly write them out of existence and never speak of them again. Which, yeah, okay, I guess. I mean, the squats were leaning particularly heavily on their fantasy um, heritage, so maybe, maybe. Additionally, Games Workshop categorically denied any accusations that they simply weren't selling well enough. Apparently, many races were selling in the roughly same percentage as the squats, so that had nothing to do with it. Of course, I would take anything that old Games Workshop said with a mountain's worth of salt, but, you know, it is a possibility. As for what happened to them properly, well, their homeworlds got om nom nom the rest of them got integrated into the Imperium, and they are now nice little law-abiding Imperial citizens. It also needs to be stressed that they do now worship the Emperor. Back in the day, they well, didn't technically worship the Emperor properly, but, you know, after the Horus Heresy and the uh, rather rapid rise of his worship, it became somewhat um, socially unacceptable for them to not do so. Luckily, however, they were into ancestor worship, and since at this point the Emperor was basically the ancestor of, well, the Imperium, the Squats kind of just shrugged and went like, okay, um, we'll worship him as an ancestor, as the supreme ancestor. Is, is everybody okay with that? And everybody kind of just nodded their heads and went like, okay, I mean, that's cool. We've got savages on fucking moons worshipping the Emperor as their bloody son, so this is pretty much the same. A little bit better, actually. So there are still squats in the Imperium, and they still fight in the Emperor's armies. There has also been some talk that the squats might be in some way related to the Demiurg, a servant race of the Tau. Personally, I don't think so. The aesthetic certainly is similar to some extent, yes, but they too clearly have very different physiologies. For example, the squats are, well, small humans. The demiurg are walking fucking rocks. Unless they've undergone some rather serious mutation recently, that doesn't sound like the same species. Additionally, the demiurg are nomadic wanderers that live their entire lives on ships. Meanwhile, the Squats actually kinda hate starships. They're not particularly fond of star travel in general. They prefer having nice, solid rock and earth beneath them. Additionally, Games Workshop has also stated that the two are, at the very least, not the exact same, though, again, it's Games Workshop. It should also be noted that for a period of time, Games Workshop tried to wipe the Squats out entirely, not just by saying they were eaten by Tyranids, but to try and wipe them from the canon entirely, as if they'd never existed, so... Once again, Games Workshop, Statement, Mountain of Salt. As far as the current state of squat lore goes, however, they do still exist and still serve within the military, though I even hesitate to use the word current because, well, it's changed so much over the years it's kind of difficult to figure out whether or not Games Workshop means half the things they do. I mean, now there is literally a squat mercenary for Necromunda, so... Clearly they're still around, but whether or not they still serve in the Imperial Guard in their usual capacity, or whether they are split up amongst other units like Abhumans often are, well, we don't know. So I'm going to make a couple assumptions. First, we're going to talk about how the Squats used to fight, and then we'll talk about how the Squats would probably fight today. So. Firstly, back when the Squats were the Squats and they had their own arsenal, they would fight utilizing a rather 
interesting thing. They were kind of jack of all trades. They had very heavy infantry equal to that of Terminators, which were pretty good in melee and ranged. They also kind of resembled the Orcs in their massive use of big bikes and trucks, often mounted with all kinds of twin-linked weaponry. And they also, of course, brought absolute ass tons of artillery, including, of course, their mighty battle trains, which were, well, gigantic land trains with guns absolutely everywhere, every last square fucking inch covered in some form of Daka Daka. Clearly, there must have been some Orc blood involved in all of this. Methinks that whilst they were trading with the Orcs, they might have done some, um, <clears throat> some interbreeding, if you know what I mean. Honestly, that's probably good enough reason to just wipe the little fuckers off the map as far as I'm concerned, but hey, the Inquisition disagrees, for the moment. Then again, the Inquisition has led Tyranid Hive fleets to attack certain systems before, as part of a strategy. Now, I'm not saying that a certain force within the Imperium sent the Tyranids to the Squats, all I'm saying is I would applaud that person if he had. Anyways, this all adds up to a rather interesting battle style, where they have large quantities of fast and relatively heavily armed, albeit not armoured, units, which would screen for vast quantities of artillery. This isn't quite as stupid an idea as you might first think, assuming that the squads can find the enemy first, then guide in the artillery to obliterate the enemy, then the lack of a solid dug-in front line wouldn't necessarily be that big of an issue. On the other hand though, they also had solid front line infantry, this is the problem because what we have really is a combination of epic rule set and 40k normal rule sets, which generally speaking contradict each other to a hilarious degree. In Epic, Space Marines, for example, tend to fight in line-based fucking warfare on open fields. Something the Asnatis haven't really been doing since the Horus Heresy because, well, flat out there just isn't enough of them to do that kind of shit. Additionally, the rules between mixing the races was uh, considerably less strict back then. For example, the Squats used a ton of Space Marine vehicles and weaponry, as did the Imperial Guard. The three kind of switched their shit around, so using that to build a bases is a little difficult, but you would essentially have Squat infantry mounted in stuff like Rhinos, which would form the infantry line, a relatively small portion of their total army, whilst the fast-moving bikes would be the front skirmishing line, who would engage the enemy and guide the artillery in on top of them. If everything goes to plan, that would then wipe out the enemy. If it didn't, then they would either have to haul the enemy counterattack, or counterattack in turn, using their slow but heavy infantry to try and break apart the main formations of the enemy, and then pick apart the survivors with massed artillery fire. Then, of course, you also got the paddle trains, which introduced us to a third way the squad would fight. This was described in the very first War for Armageddon book, not the one I covered, the one actually back from the Rogue Trader days, when a Inquisitor landed on Armageddon with a bunch of squads and battle trains, and essentially blitzkrieged their merry little dwarfish asses across Armageddon, butchering the orcs in their tens of thousands as they went. Now, again, in reality, a battle train would be a really, really shitty weapon. It is fucking massive, it would require absurd amounts of fuel, it could be hit from fucking orbit, and would be incredibly vulnerable to any kind of artillery or large caliber gunfire. I mean, this would be an anti-tank gunner's wet fucking dream, a target he literally couldn't miss. And considering the things were literally filled to the brim with ammunition and guns, it really doesn't matter where you hit it, you're gonna be setting off something. Now, of course, they did have quite a lot of armor, but if you are the size of 107 broadside barns, you're gonna get hit a lot. And even if you're deflecting 90% of those hits, well, the tens that go through are still going to be rather unfortunate. Not, of course, to mention the obvious problem that if one of the carts in the middle gets hit, well, you're kind of bored now. Now you have a pile of burning munitions and possibly fuel cells, etc., that you can't dump from the train without dumping the other half of the train in the middle of more carts filled to the brim with ammunition and possibly fuel cells. 
Yeah, uh, the whole battle train thing looks cool, but it's not a particularly good idea. But how would the squats fight if they were reintroduced today in a more quote-unquote realistic fashion? Uh, well, considering the fact that at this point they would almost certainly be almost entirely integrated into the Imperial Guard, I suspect the answer would be somewhat boring. I suspect they would be used more or less like regular Imperial Guardsmen, perhaps with a slightly larger focus on quick reconnaissance vehicles, or maybe a little bit more artillery, for example, but they'd probably be driving around in chimeras, in all the likelihood, equipped with basic standard-issue LAS guns, maybe some modified weapons, perhaps? They were very fond of tinkering with stuff, after all, but, well, here's the thing. They were very fond of tinkering with stuff using scientific knowledge. Tinkering with LAS guns, using scientific knowledge, and having that being discovered by the Mechanicum, that might be a very, very bad thing. In fact, I'd be extremely surprised if they didn't get slapped for tech heresy right then and there. I suspect that God only knows how many hundreds, if not thousands of years, within the very, very orthodox and backwards Imperium, will probably have bred some of their more, um, shall we say, unique traits straight out of them. Though, there is also the fact that the Squats can get very, very old. We know at the very least that they can be 300 years old, and some of them are even older, so it is possible that only, you know, two or three generations have really passed, and they've been able to hold on to most of their traditions, and maybe, just maybe, They've been able to sneak most of this past the Mechanicus? Eh, it's not impossible, but we know how anal the Mechanicus is about these things, and if they heard any rumors that the Squats might be creating new technology, they'd probably be very interested in burning said Squat on a very small pyre. With that being said, though, there is one potential loophole. You see, the Imperial Guard leaves a certain degree of autonomy up to the individual Guard regiments. It kind of depends on the regiment's history, on their homeworld's history, and so on, but some are given far more freedom than others. For example, the Mordian Iron Guard. They can do pretty much whatever they want. They can wear their own uniforms, bring their own weapons, use their own body armor, use their own doctrines, and the wider Imperium isn't really going to care, because it's the Mordian Iron Guard. They don't fuck up, like ever. Another example would be the Maccabi and Janissaries, who have their own version of the Lasgun, a considerably heftier weapon, and nobody really cares, because again, they're the Maccabi and Janissaries. They're fanatically loyal religious crazies. Maybe, just maybe, the Squats have acquired something along the lines of the same reputation. In which case, the wider Imperium would probably overlook a fair degree of, um, customization of their equipment. For example, maybe a regiment of squats had specialized in being heavy infantry, pairing the resilience and brute toughness of the squats with nice, heavy, customized, powered armor, and maybe some nice, big, fat bolter rifles as well. As long as they were effective and didn't turn to chaos, they might be allowed to continue doing so. Whether the Squats are more or less likely to fall to Chaos, we don't really know. We do know that they were Chaos Squats, but we don't know how many, how large of a percentage of the population, etc. Though the current population is extraordinarily likely to be very, very loyal indeed, because, of course, again, their primary religion is ancestral worship, and since any loyalist squat inside of the Imperium today must have had a loyalist forefather, and they worship said loyalist forefather, well, it seems rather unlikely that they'd suddenly turn to chaos. At the end of the day, though, I think it is a question of degrees. If they started recreating squat technology like their tanks, or their hellbores, or some other crazy shit, the Mechanicus probably wouldn't let that slip, but modifications on their LAS guns, modifications on their armor, maybe using a different type of weaponry? Maybe, maybe. Personally, if the Squats were ever to return, I would like to see them be a super 
resilient faction. Their weaponry would be kinda meh, nothing, nothing particularly special, maybe just basic lasguns for the majority of their troops, with a few fancy things here and there, some thud guns, some small artillery batteries, maybe some very expensive elites with good weaponry or some heavy support troops like that. But they could be a faction with relatively low cost troops that were very, very, very tough, but couldn't deal a huge amount of damage. Essentially, they would be the exact opposite of the Tau, and they would primarily win battles by seizing and holding ground, rather than simply just wiping out the enemy. It would be an interesting take on the Imperial Guard way of fighting, kind of like an IG mix with a little bit of Space Marine in there. Could be interesting, and certainly very, very squattish. I'm not going to hold my breath though, I think it was already in 2016 where Games Workshop basically said that, yeah no, we're probably never going to bring back the squats in any like real capacity. You might see a hint at them here or there, maybe some individual models like we indeed did see, but they are very unlikely to ever become a major faction within 40k again. Which I gotta admit, I'm kind of fine with. I mean, we've got so many Imperial factions these days that I don't think another one is really that necessary right now. Anyways, that has been my lore video on the Squats. It's um a little bit loose and fast due to the nature of the source material, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of um, canon conflicts, but... Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.